Welcome everyone. We acknowledge that our work takes place on unceded and occupied territories of the 575 plus native nations. We are inviting you to take a moment to reflect on whose land you are living and working on. And if you don't know, to research and reflect. I'd like to introduce a dear friend, a young artist, model, uh, traditional singer, Alex Rose Holiday. She will be performing a traditional song to bless this interview. Um, so this song that I'm going to sing is called Children of Our Holy Land. Thank you, Alex, that was beautiful. <clears throat> Today we're here with our 13th annual Native Women in Film and Television and All Media Film Festival. We are streaming 40 films directed by women, plus five conversation series with extraordinary women uh, in regards to all facets of the film industry, entertainment industry. Today, the conversation is going to be who tells the story matters, representation matters. And I'm going to introduce everyone and then, uh, and then, we'll, and then I'll come back to each individual and we will start the conversation with questions and, and so forth. My first guest, 
is a very dear friend and we've worked together on, on different projects and we did a film together with Willie Nelson called Baba Rosa and Dr. Alma Martinez. Alma is an actress, stage director and a professor at theater. She is best known for her roles in film and television shows, including the Peabody Award winning drama series, The Bridge. She has been in countless stage performances on Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, Mexican and European stages. She has been in so many TV series. The list is from here all the way to Mexico. <laughs> her resume is extensive. She is extremely talented. I just adore her. And I'd like for you all to welcome Elma Martinez. Hello, everyone. Our next guest is Georgina Lightning. Georgina is Cree Bear Clan Territory 8, is a storyteller, storyteller, filmmaker, actress, public speaker, and activist for change. With 30 years of experience in the film and TV industry, her films have garnered several awards, including the White House Epic Award given to emerging artists who change the world with the works they create, such as the narrative feature film, Older Than America exposing the residential school reality. Our next guest is Michelle Shenandoah. And I'm a relative of the Haudenosaunee Nation because I have a, a, a nephew over there. Michelle is a writer, speaker, thought leader, and traditional member of the Oneida Nation Wolf Clan of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Her and her husband, Neil, Neil Prowls has also operated Indigenous Concepts Counseling with the goal of incorporating Indigenous perspectives into the mainstream and in existing business and media uh, relations. As the founder of, Michelle, help me pronounce that. Rematriation. Rematriation, me and my dyslexia. Yeah. Rematriation <laughs> magazine. Um, an Indigenous women's online platform, Michelle is focused on leadership development and the reclaiming of Indigenous women's traditional roles among their nations. And our fourth guest is uh, Connie Perez Anderson. And Connie is a certified public accountant who began her career with regional film based in Kern County as a staff accountant and rose through the ranks to become one of the only two Latinas, which is a made up word, to, uh, to make partner in the 40 year history of, of film, of the firm. The firm has a substantial experience, experience managing the accounts of major governmental architect, uh, uh, Help me with that, Connie. Ag. Agriculture and uh, corporations. She assisted other partners in managing the firm's multi-million uh, dollar budget. And why we've asked Connie to join us is because she is now uh, the executive board uh, chief uh, officer at the UFW. Uh, which is the Farm Workers Association, which is union, which is so powerful, you know, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And so we welcome Connie. And, um, and I could go on with everybody's resume and I have tons of paper, but I, I want to get to the dialogue here, the conversation. I think that'll be more powerful. Everyone could look these incredible, talented, gorgeous women up on the internet. Okay, so let's have this conversation. And the conversation, I'm gonna pose this question and we'll start with Elma. Is Hollywood really being inclusive when they use the word diversity when it comes to native indigenous talent or are they just checking the box? And is it still a black and white conversation in Hollywood? The loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> well, it's loaded because you're, you're, you're placing it as an oppositional binary. Okay. I think what, uh, what this new generation has taught us that uh, we should do away with oppositional binaries, good, bad, 
right, wrong, male, female. You know, it's 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 all about the gray in between, the the spectrum as they call it. So um, yeah, posing it at oppositional binary is always is always is always plagued because if mm. you don't fulfill something 100%, then you're not 100% on board. So is it better? Yes, because I'm what, I'm 70 years old now and have been this a while. Is better, we have a long way to go. I mean, a, a very long way to go. And I'm in education now also as well. So I really, I mean, I have to tell you, I really believe it starts with education. I mean, recently, um, um, and I have to say this up, Jane Champion is a phenomenal film, filmmaker. But, you know, she did a faux pas and she apologized for it where she said, you know, well, you know, Serena and Venus Williams are, you know, phenomenal talents. I mean, obviously, but they didn't have to go up against men. Mm. So in that in that way, she was separating herself from their struggle. But she came back and apologized profusely. And my point being that we all make those we, we make those mistakes. So. My point being that the industry is moving forward, but it starts with educate. People have to be educated. And so as an educator, now I'm seeing that, ladies and gentlemen, our kids that are going from high school into college, I'm a college professor now, I mean, they're not being taught any of this. I mean, not even being taught about their own roots, their own indigenous roots, their own Mexican roots, their own contributions as far as as, as a society, a culture to the American persona. That's what we're talking about. Who is truly American? When we're representing, what are we representing? When we say representing, well, we're representing America. Well, what is America? And I think the big question that's we're all here working in that area, trying to redefine what that is. And again, as a professor, that's what I'm dealing with. And I think we have a long way to go, but again, it isn't about an oppositional binary. It's the spectrum of knowledge and awareness that I think we're making gains, but a way to go. Thank you, Alma. You're welcome. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's on point. And, um, and I love addressing um, situations in where we can be informative to our audience and lead the conversation into exploring, right? The inclusive. What are we really doing? What are we really doing to be inclusive in the entertainment industry? Because I too have been in this for 44 years, 65 years old this year. And, you know, <laughs> so yeah. So Georgina, um, what, what is your point on this, uh, you know, the entertainment industry and being inclusive? Well, I've been in, you know, I moved to Los Angeles in 1990. And when I got there, it was the begin like Dances with Wolves was just happening, right? So everybody was flocking to LA. And then, you know, we had a moment there with Leathers and Feathers. You know, Ted Turner and Jane Fonda did the whole series, Tecumseh, Geronimo, Broken Chain, etc. <laughs> um, you know, that was, a, that was a moment for us. But then it died. And then we had nothing for a long time, you know, and we, we just... We, we get to see each other uh, during um, Thanksgiving, you know, the turkey guilt, the turkey uh, editions that they always had of guest stars, and then the summer leather and feathers. So we really didn't, we were never represented in a contemporary balance until Netflix revolutionized and changed the power structure of Hollywood. And they're my heroes. I love and adore them because they go into communities that are not represented. And instead of being like, gonna be honest here, Disney and going in and exploiting story in, in indigenous countries all over the world. They actually, Netflix is all over the world empowering indigenous people and saying, you're the best storyteller. You're the best person to tell this story because you know it better than anyone. So they empower them and they get behind them as storytellers, which is revolutionizing everything. And so I never thought this would happen in my lifetime. But it is. And we get to see people like Taika and, and Sterling and Sierra and like, you know, on mainstream doing amazing things. And now they're on platforms. Um, Spirit Awards, the kids, you know, one of our homegirls from Alexander Reservation is winning a Spirit Award. I mean, who imagined that would happen? So there are changes and we have to celebrate the victories that we have. I'm very grateful for those victories. And what it's doing is it's in empowering and encouraging a lot of other storytellers that, you know, had that not happened, 
they'd be sitting there with um, brilliant ideas, but never going forward in it. Now they see examples of victory and they're going, wow, if Sterling can do it from Oklahoma, maybe I can, you know? So I think there's a whole new generation of storytellers that are going to emerge from this and we're just going to see an explosion and they're not going to be able to stop us. Hollywood, you know, has not funded a feature film or a series in the history of storytelling of Hollywood. 120 years, shame on Hollywood, has not gotten behind anything until we saw, you know, the CBC Peacock piece with uh, the, the Rutherford Falls with um, Sierra Ornelas is making the Rutherford Falls piece. I mean, that's history. History is being made right now. You know, I had the pleasure of being cast in that uh, so I got to, you know, be on the set with women. I mean, Tazba, like, it was women that were running the set, that were the writers, that were there behind the camera. It was a moment. I, I, like, when I arrived there at Universal Studios, Universal Studios is where they're shooting it. And I get there and they're like, you know, they cart me to the COVID test, the, the whole COVID insanity. But then after that, we're driving, we're going to a studio. And I was like, I have to take a moment here. I'm not here as a visitor, as a tourist. I'm here as an actor on the Universal Studios lot with Indigenous women, I'm getting goosebumps, making content that they created. That is history. That was brilliant at that moment was overwhelming for me. I didn't even know how to process an emotion. I'm like, how am I supposed to feel right now? Oh my God, I want to scream, but they, you know, they would have locked me in and not have, to it's like, what's this crazy woman, you know? on a golf cart going to a uh, wardrobe, but it was, it was a profound moment. And I'm so grateful for that moment. So I only see us going forward. Inclusivity, you know, remember Janelle, I worked with uh, affirmative action back in 1910, right? It, at SAG. And that yeah. was a buzzword. Diversity was a buzzword. It was all, yeah. it was BS, right? So mm -hmm. for several years, I worked on those initiatives where Everybody, like CBC, NBC, everybody was doing their acting showcases, right? Directing showcases, producer showcases. And after 10 years, I remember having a meeting with Carmen Smith from CBC, like all the players saying, okay, we, I've been recruiting people from all over the country for all of these initiatives. Tell me, in this last pilot season, and we all know what pilot season is, how many hundreds of roles that is, thousands of roles. In pilot season, how many First Nations people were? On the, on the list for, for roles. And there was an awkward silence and they said, none. And I went, wow, man, after 10 years, producers, even guest producer or sh like on any of the series, even on one episode, none. And directors, any directors, I, even on one episode of one season of one thing, zero. So I went, oh my gosh. I, don't ever call me again. I will never participate in any of this again. That's when I started Tribal Alliance Production. It's like, we have to make our own stuff. We have to create our own work. Hollywood's never going to get behind us. So unless we're creating our own content and creating our own opportunities, we're never going to get anywhere. That's where Older Than America, all, the, all of our stuff after that is about creating our own content and creating our own opportunities in front of and behind the cameras, right? Because Hollywood's not going to do it. And once yeah. they see, oh, wow, these Indians, I can make some cool stuff. <laughs> then they're going to want to be part of the party because they want to exploit everything, right? Yeah. Disney goes to every country in the world and exploits them. So, you know, part of my speech right now is like, you know, I'm indigenous. So, you know, they exploit everything else, right? In Alberta, oil, coal, or water. Like story, man. You know how brilliant our storytellers are? We have stories that we haven't even, we haven't even tapped into them. We're still talking about trauma. Our, our, our content is still trauma-based, right? We're talking about what happened to us. Wait till, you, wait till they blow up and exploit the story that, uh, I mean, from all of our characters in our ceremony. Like, oh my gosh, it's going to be amazing. I can't wait yeah. for that to happen. And that's coming. It's coming. You know, my kids, my, my, my son Cody just produced his first feature that he wrote and produced, and it's an com insane comedy. I mean, yeah, Indians are laughing, and they do crazy comedies, you know? And the kids are on tour. I just sent them off on tour with Bear Grease, right? A musical. So we're, you know, yeah. we're about there. We're about, we're ready to explode. So 
things are going to happen in the next five years. Let's let's have this conversation again, ladies. Yes, absolutely. You know? Let's all talk about the victories yeah. in this. Five years. Yeah. Well, yeah. Georgina, you this is so it's just really exciting because you brought up a couple of things, right? And um, just for our listening audience, global listening audience, you know, when I first started, it, the first lead role I had was a girl called Hatter Fox, and that was the first contempt in the United States, and that was the first contemporary Native woman story produced, right? Then it took Hollywood 42 years later. 42 years, let that say, 42 years later for Netflix to do Chambers, right? And then as far as primetime television, NBC, CBS, Fox, you know, ABC, 2003 to 2019, we did not see Native actresses on episodic television in a lead role, star, featured guest star, extra in the back, mm -hmm. drinking coffee, nothing, nothing. Uh, and I used to make my living as an episodic actress, right? And the first year that that happened, I said, okay, I wonder what's going on. And then the second year, and then the third year, and 16 years later, nothing mm -hmm. until 2019, right? We had two, we had, we had uh, Irene Bedard and we had Tantoon. And those series were like basically a tax write-off. They weren't going to go, you could tell. And so those were, were taken off. And, and now we're back to square one again. No one in episodic television. Cable is a different thing. That's a whole gorgeous, whole other entity that's just phenomenal. So, you know, and, and, and you brought up something else, Georgina, uh, Screen Actors Guild, which I've been a member for 44 years, right? And I sat on the EEOC for many, many, many years. It's the only thing I ever quit because of the issues that you brought up. It's the only thing in my life, because I'm not a quitter, I don't quit. But my kids sat me down and said, mom, this is taking a lot of your energy and it's not going anywhere. So exit, and I did. They were right, I listened to my kids. So there's, so I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm, I'm giving good positive energy, the energy towards our union to really make a difference and be transparent when it comes to our native community and engaging us and not just a selected group, but the whole body of all of our women and our men, uh, actors within our union, because we all pay dues. We all pay dues, money wise, <laughs> so, to the union, to the union. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I want to, I want to bring in, um, our other guest, uh, Michelle, uh, and Michelle, um, you know, you're over there in, you know, the Haudenosaunee Nation, right? Which is very, well, all of our nations are powerful, but the Haudenosaunee Nation is like, okay, that's when the black robes came to shore. And so let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And, um, you know, thinking of inclusion makes me think of the diversity of our own stories, even as Indigenous people, right? So there's no pan-Indigenous story that encapsulates, you know, one experience of who we are. And um, I have to say, it's so wonderful to listen to Alma and to listen to Georgina. I could just keep listening all day. And I want to take Alma's class, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, but this, this whole conversation just really leads me to why I founded Rematriation. And it's, um, it's really founded in the voice of our Indigenous women and kind of even leading back to the roots of our own traditional birthing practices as Indigenous women and the movement that's happening and reclaiming our identity, reclaiming our traditional ways and understandings of who we are and, and living into that and walking that and breathing that and being it in the world, right? So we have moved into a space um, where we're a digital storytelling platform. We're multimedia. We have film, podcasts, audios that we share out on our website and social media. But the real reason of founding this organization was to bring forth the voice of our women so that we could hear 
from our own perspectives, right? How many of us as indigenous women like looked into history, looked into media and didn't see ourselves reflected there, didn't find our stories. And I think back to the words of one of our clan mothers uh, here from the Mohawk nation who had said, you know, what I wouldn't give to know my great grandmother's story. She has a black and white photo of her, but that's it. She doesn't really know much else about her. And so for me, that was important to make sure that we are telling our story. We're recording it in whatever format necessary, right? And whatever storytelling ways that we have that are ours, that that becomes the vehicle, right? So that we don't have to have it fit into a particular type of story format, right? So it can be literally feeling like you're sitting at a kitchen table with all of your aunties and sisters and laughing and feeling like, you know, yeah, I'm understanding who I am, right? So um, what I think is really amazing is during the last, you know, couple of years, we have seen so much transformation. And prior to 2020, um, here at Rematriation, we were working on a nine-part film series called Indigenous Women's Voices. And they're actually now all up on our website, which is so super exciting. And those were really based on telling our story and moving beyond what people think of when they think of Indigenous women which is centered around statistics, you know, the, the horribles of horribles, but yet like look at these amazing women and the wonderful things that they're doing in their own world and not for themselves. And I think that's one thing people come to discover with indigenous community is that we do it for each other. We do that for, we tell the story for our nations. We tell the story for our mother earth. And I think that that's so essential to understand from a cultural perspective and why we do have to tell the story because we haven't had that space to tell our own stories where anthropologists have been telling the stories about us, the government has been telling the stories about us, and what's happened? We've been invisibilized or marginalized. And so our voice matters, right? I think, you know, even here at Rematriation, one of our you know, themes that we put out is that our stories matter, right? And, and you have to take time to listen. I think that's really important for the mainstream to really understand is when you're listening to indigenous stories is that you have to really take off the lens that you've had on and, and not expect a story to fulfill particular expectations that a lot of westernized Hollywood stories have created and yet be open right? To be open to the teachings and understanding that in these beautiful little nuances are stories that come from our elders that have been passed down for thousands of years. And it's this oral history and tradition that continues to guide us and to lead us. And that's why these stories matter. That's why they're so important, because in them are these wonderful gifts and these seeds of how we as human beings should conduct our lives on this planet and so that we can be in balance with our mother earth so that she's not sending these powerful storms to tell us to knock it off and you know behave better as human beings and i think that's one thing for the world to really recognize with indigenous stories and also understand that as indigenous women right even more so that to hear that because we have that relationship that connection to mother earth and to her heartbeat and being those life givers right she shares through us and that indigenous peoples really speak the language of the land of where we're from right so my language is different than those you know nations of people who are from the desert or from you know the high elevations and the mountains right we all have a language that's really very specific and rooted to where we're from so i think that it becomes essential like when we think about land acknowledgements right you read a land acknowledgement at the beginning and talked about reflecting on the land so i urge people to also think about the indigenous voice of the land of where you're located not just in North America, but really even more specifically, the region and the location of where you're from, because there's knowledge there about how to live in harmony and peace with that particular land upon which your feet rest or where your house is placed, right? And so that's 
that's the moment we're in now in this time in this world. We have to get very specific in that way. And so as we look out into our future, these stories, they do matter because embedded within the stories, whether they're humorous, whether they're sad, there's always something there to teach us about how to conduct ourselves. So I think that when we talk about inclusivity and we're talking about indigenous story, and I think it's a beautiful thing that's happening right now, right? That we you know, do have those um, big you know, name companies, whether it's like Netflix or it's HBO or it's Amazon or whomever it is, right? Is going into uh, here and, and, and put money into films that are from local areas. And uh, I think it's wonderful, right? So when I started these film series for rematriation, that wasn't happening. And I said, we have to tell our own story, right? So that's that's now what you can see from, from rematriation. And so this is a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Janelle, for inviting me to be a part of it. You're welcome, Michelle. And I, I you, you also, as well as every uh, uh, Elma and Georgina brought up something, you know, yesterday in our conversation, what came up uh, real quickly is that, you know, our stories are untapped. So Hollywood keeps, the entertainment industry, Hollywood keeps regurgitating the same story over and over again, maybe with a new facelift, same story over and over again. But our stories are completely untapped, completely untapped. We think, just like Michelle, like in our languages, we don't have the words for war or hate or, you know, the cussing or none of that. So our thought process on that level, as far as language and communication is, is, is different and, um, and hasn't been tapped into. Uh, when you sit with an elder, you can listen to him for hours or her for hours, and there's maybe one or two sentences that is so gorgeous and so precious that a whole film can be developed uh, from it. So these are all really untapped stories, but the bottom line is they're human stories, they're relatable stories. We all have red blood, our animals have red blood, so they're all an everyday story that have completely been untapped. So I too am looking forward to the future of being more inclusive of the entertainment industry to financially support our filmmakers in um, making films and, and TV series. Um, so let's move on to uh, um, one, one other thing. I do wanna dedicate this uh, conversation series to my sister, Joanne Shenandoah. And I could feel her as when Michelle was talking. So I just want to say that she recently passed um, in November and uh, she was on our board for Native Women in Film and Television. So Joanne, we feel you, love you. Yeah, thank you for that, Janelle. Yeah. Okay, so um, Connie. I met Connie the other night at a screening in Santa Monica. Uh, uh, with Dolores Huerta, and we were watching the new Cesar Chavez film, which is all about music, because music has the power to bring us all together. It's the universal language. And Connie was, was, was on the panel, and I was just like, oh my, she has to be on. She has to be on this conversation. She's representing one, my point of view, one of the most um, relevant and, go and, and, and beautiful uh, unions, organizations, that we have um, out there because it because they deal and have always dealt with the food that's on our table, the food that nur nur nurtures us, that's on our table, the food that we eat, the food that we eat shows on our face as we get older. By the way, <laughs> so so I I just um, I want to welcome Connie and and I'd love to hear your challenges in being in this new seat that you have um, with the organization and, um, and how you feel about the, uh, the inclusive conversation. Yes, first of all, thank you for this opportunity to be part of, of this space. Um, being a, a CPA on the other side of the entertainment industry, right? I crunched numbers all day. Um, I did that for 15 years, but I think it's important that 
I put myself in places like this where I'm able to tell the story of the people that we represent as part of the UFW, which are the people that have been out there the last two years um, during a pandemic and putting food on our table. And, and I saw a lot of the mistreatment of this community over the past two years. And I knew that I just had to put myself out, outside of my comfort zone, sit on a panel with Dolores Huerta and Paul Chavez, um, the son of Cesar, because I think the story is very important. And um, to Alma's point about educating people, I think it's important that people know the story of the movement and the struggles that we still have to this day. And I think through education and understanding this community, we will be able to accomplish more for um, our farm working community. My parents were farm workers. They came from, from Mexico. My mom was pregnant with me when she came to um, the United States. And I grew up in a labor camp until I was 17 years old. So this movement has been part of my entire, my entire life. And um, when I was in public accounting, I knew it was time to leave after 15, 16 years um, because I just felt that I wasn't doing enough for my community, um, given all the opportunities that I've had because of the sacrifices from so many people in the movement over the years. And so I am committed to dedicating the rest of my career, you know, to advocate for this community and being a voice for them in any space that I'm able to do that. And we, we, do, we do have a lot of great stories. Um, so if you guys have an opportunity to see the documentary, Song for Caesar, yeah. please um, take the time to do that. Well, thank you, Connie. And I'd like everyone, the audience, to know that um, the connection with uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta for my family is that my, my uh, uncle, uh, Congressman Edward R. Roybal, um, he was the first Latino to take a seat in, in Los Angeles City Council. And he ended up and, and then going on to be a councilman. But he was the first to be supportive of um, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta when, 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 you know, when it all, when it all uh, happened, start, you know, launched. Um, but I, I uh, so I feel his energy too. <laughs> They're all here <laughs> celebrating us. And, you know, I was, I was just thinking too that, um, you know, with Georgina, you know, Georgina and I go way back. We worked on Dreamkeeper together when our kids were very, very, very little. And, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and like I said, with, with Alma and Michelle. So we're gonna all come back on the screen together um, and um, open it up for a full on um, uh, dialogue about, um, I think maybe if everyone could share about your own personal experience in this industry as being an indigenous woman, right? Maybe highlight just a couple of quick stories as um, we have about another 10 minutes. Uh, and um, Alma, <laughs> Alma, you are, Alma, we're both in the Academy too, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Alma helped me get, get into the Academy. So thank you, Alma. <laughs> we I have to tell you, I have to yeah. tell you when I got into the Academy, I mean, I was like, first of all, like, wow, I'm in. But then, but then you contact me and said, Alma, can you help me? And I said, wait a minute, I can help people now? Yeah. <laughs> so, so because you contacted me, you empowered me by saying, help me. I go, of course I will. I've got nine other people of color in, and there's an indigenous woman of your community. I, I contacted and said, you've got to come in. You need to be here. And my mission with the Academy is, is voting, but getting other people of color in. And that's what I've done. And that's what I'm, I'm tell you most proud of. And so now we're up for also voting for the Academy. And this is related, I have to tell you. And I keep seeing, it's like, and this is all ladies and uh, ladies about the paradigm of what is considered successful. And mm. what is considered successful is kind of at the root of decolonizing the classroom, decolonization theory, which is what I do in everything. My plays, my classes, my lit courses, my criticism decolonizing and it goes back to education. I mean, it has to go back to education. If people of color, Latinos, for example, don't realize that their brown skin means they're indigenous. I mean, right there, they don't even realize that because we were raised in Mexico. I won't get into the politics of how that changed. 
it was after the Mexican Revolution, they decided let's make everybody united by making us all mestizos. Regardless of your background, we're all mestizos and we're one Mexico. Well, my point, so moving forward, what I'm saying is the academy, it's kind of what I'm doing, I'm decolonizing the academy. It's like, wait a minute. So what is considered excellence? And that goes back to the paradigm of basically this divisive American white predominantly male ideal of what is successful, what is considered, you know, good leadership, the founding fathers, et cetera. So that's why decolonization and education is so important. But back to the academy, what I'm doing is when I vote, I don't vote for something that's considered successful. I look for that voice that's telling a message in a different way, looking at life, a story in a different way, something that hasn't been said, something that hasn't been explained or shown. Technically, maybe they don't have the million dollar budgets. Maybe they don't have the big names. Maybe they didn't make, it wasn't a package deal in the sense of you have the stars, you know, the star directors, the, you know, hundred million dollar budgets. I'm looking for the best untold story. And I won't tell you how I voted, but you can imagine. So my goal then is again, that if we're not, we have to start changing the systems and it's slow. And again, I thank you for that. In education, I'm decolonizing, and as maybe you all know, ethnic studies is all under, is being basically voted out by states. You cannot teach race theory, you cannot teach critical race theory, you cannot teach decolonial theory, and you cannot, tier, you cannot teach queer studies. So that is under attack, under attack. So um, we're in a critical time. Uh, let me be positive. On a positive note, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, on a positive note, I am here in this room. I am here in this room with all these incredibly accomplished, articulate, and and movers and shakers, women of color. And I have to tell you, I'm I'm honored and I'm inspired to be here. And I think this is happening all over the country. Yeah. And what's going to happen eventually is we're all basically going to start lifting lifting the industry to where it should be slowly within our fields within because as you say the talent is there the yeah. stories are there we just have to get people in a position and again the academy where they can move into positions where they vote positions where they can make a difference and in the industry itself behind the desks like connie right now with her being at the ufw it's known to be a very male dominated yeah. union connie that's the yeah. history of it you yeah. know Dolores Huerta has not had an easy time, right. but God bless her, she is a fighter and she's there. And so my point being that this is just um, endemic of the change that's happening. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Well, you know, uh, Alma, uh, the theme to the festival, Native Women in Film and Television Fest Film Festival is women decolonizing the entertainment industry. That's our theme, that's that's the conversation. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Um, so anyone want to chime in, get into, uh, into this? I just wanted to um, bring something up here. Here in Kern County, we have a, you know, a long history with, with the movement and our population is mostly Latino population. But the university, Cal State Bakersfield, did not have an ethnic studies department. And Alma mentioned that. And I was part of a group um, that pushed to have that done. And they just approved the department this last December. Yeah, because I think wow. it's important that we have that, especially here in Central California. And I'm also involved with the Center for Social Justice at the university in helping uh, tell the story. So I'd love to bring some of your stories to Central California. Fantastic. That, that's done. <laughs> that's doable. Georgina? You know, well, I mean, you know, ideas beget ideas. And Alma talked about so many things that, you know, it's sparking a million yeah. thoughts in the community, you know? Uh, so this conversation could go on forever. But yeah. I love and applaud what you're doing, um, Alma. I mean, education and talking about where the measurement of success and how that's addressed and what's, what the definition of success is huge. Um, in making a feature film, when you're not included, when you're not part of the system, you have to raise your own money. You have to have private in investors, which means you have to have good relations 
which means, you know, I mean, it goes back and back. But, so it's a whole thing to raise your own financing for your own feature film and then to get it on Netflix and to distribute it around the world. And then you think, oh, I heard of so many other people, according to all the film festivals I've attended forever, yeah. that when you do a feature film and you get it distributed worldwide and you have this certain success that you get a development deal or you get a first look deal, or you get some kind of deal. Nope, not if you're indigenous woman. There's no way. Nobody that I know of to this date has ever gotten a development deal. I've got a slate of a million projects and none of us are getting deal. We don't get the same privilege. And I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay anybody, but- No, this isn't downplaying, Georgina. This is, these are hard, cold facts that need fact. to be discussed. Yeah. No, and you know, I come to Canada right now because I have a, a tita, my two tita, um, my grandbabies, my four-year-old Malia and my two and a half-year-old Kisik are here. So we have to do, we'll, we'll be here for a while doing ceremonies back in Edmonton. It's a harsh place to live. But then I'll go back, you know, and do whatever I can in, in Los Angeles or wherever I have to be. But um, when I come here to Canada, when I start as a filmmaker here in this system that works here, which is different than Hollywood, I have to start right at the beginning. Why? Because I'm not a part of the system here. I've never a qualified or applied for government funding. So I have to start right at the beginning, which means that for develop, like I'm set up to fail here, even though I've, you know, done all this other stuff. So it's like, none of that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, I never had handed. And Gwyneth Paltrow, let's look at an example of white privilege. Okay. And I'm not downplaying her as a woman. She's a, a beautiful human being. Okay. I'm just saying, if you compare a Gwyneth Paltrow who had family in the industry and the access that she had, as opposed to an indigenous woman who had, you know, a path that had to crawl out of trauma, was born in trauma, survived, got out of trauma, left and did all of this stuff in order to get the opportunity to be cast and then performed it with excellence. They're not even in the competition. They don't even get in the competition. They don't have Auntie, Uncle, and Bob and, and Dick and Harry to, you know, support them. So I love what you're doing, Alma. My hat's off to you. Education does is everything. And the measure of success, what is that? If we could take a look at filmmakers and how they got their story made and the access that they had, that would change everything right there. Just that aspect alone. I'm going to leave it at that and let, yeah. the, let Michelle Connie talk, but... Love what you're doing, Emma. Michelle? You know, the conversations get to be so wonderful and deep. You forget sometimes what the question was, the original <laughs> question. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm just, um, um, you know, reflecting upon the words that are being spoken and, you know, hearing about the fact that, you know, even now there's yet another layer, even within education, where there's more restrictions and limitations at a time when storytelling you'd think would be, you know, or is, I should say, freeing itself. Now, if you look at within the realms of education and the restrictions that are being placed um, upon that, right? So it's sort of like, you know, where's this, this open door? And I think as Indigenous peoples, we've always had to find our own path, our own um, you know, way through this and just continuing to be and to assert ourselves, right? So um, even last year, I launched a Haudenosaunee Filmmakers Festival, right? So we have wonderful Indigenous filmmakers from across Turtle Island. And I said, well, I really want to know how many Haudenosaunee filmmakers are out there. So let's just, let's throw our own film festival. And it was just wonderful. And I was just so pleased. So many people from around the world tuned in for it. And um, there was just some really fabulous stories that were out there. But, you know, looking at, you know, what's going on within Hollywood, you know, what's going on with Indigenous film, right? We're in this like space of transition and it is really a beautiful time. I really loved how Georgina talked about celebrating victories. And I still feel, yeah, we still have so much more to share and, and to, uh, to divulge and um, in, in developing the story, right? Um, or stories, I should say. Um, and within the Haudenosaunee Filmmakers Festival, we held a series of panels and I kind of kept like challenging, like, okay, how do we, you know, push the narrative farther? And we started talking about futurism and I had just this amazing um, 
great conversation with, with filmmakers and traditional language speakers. And just this understanding that when we think about futurism, right, and we think about futurism within film, I, I came to realize that we don't even really need to think about futurism in Indigenous story as much as it is about when we can jump into that perspective with our own lens, it becomes futuristic, right? It's just this whole other reality that still has yet to be shared and to be told. And you know, coming back to our whole point of being here and being in charge, I just want to reel this back for a moment and, and think about when we saw the Me Too movement um, moving across the country. I knew immediately, uh, you know, with all the work that I do with women sort of centered around um, healing through intergenerational trauma, that we had to claim um, our space within the Me Too narrative. And we created a film called An Indigenous Response to Me Too. And you can find that up on Vimeo, it'll soon be up on our website. But that was really a conversation for indigenous women to actually show that th something else is going on here. This is not about sexual violence in the workplace, but there's something completely different. And it's embedded within that education that we're kind of all really talking about that becomes important for the country here to understand is that there's a history that is also untold, right? There is a, a history of of uh, you know, these settling uh, nations that have come here and completely just erased our stories from history. So not only do we have that history that has to be told, but we also have yet all this beautiful indigenous story that still has yet to come forward. Um, so, you know, those are a couple of things that I wanted to share, you know, before we got off the, yeah. the, the this wonderful talk today. So I don't even know if I answered your question, Danelle, but oh, this is, it's, all, it's all, it's all in it's all in divine order. It's all, it's all gorgeous. <laughs> and um, I also wanted to share though really quickly as well. Thank you so much for bringing up, you know, my, my aunt Joanne and, you know, with her passing, it was really just shocking for so many and really shocking for our family and just the beautiful legacy that she has left and, and gifted to all of us within the entertainment industry, within Hollywood as well. And she just did such wonderful work. And we were very, very fortunate to be able to work with her before her passing. And Rematriation has a film that we did with her um, that we created that's also uh, available for viewing. So I'll share that with you, Janelle, too. Yeah. Maybe that's something you'd want to share. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll get it into the, to our bigger festival this year. Um, well, Michelle, you brought up um, the Me Too movement, and we'll just we'll we'll start to wrap this up because it's going over an hour, and I know everyone has to get back to their life. And I just want to bring up the thing about the Me Too movement. Um, Native women in film and television, you know, we have a uh, board of directors, and um, which Joanne was 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 on, and um, when that when that launched, when the Golden Globes happened in, in, uh, on January 7th, 2018, I was watching and, and all the women were dressed in black and it was why we wear black. And I thought, you know, and I called Michelle, I called everyone, remember? <laughs> like, we're, so we launched why we wear red. And what that is, it's a call to action. And it's a call to action uh, in this regard that the, um, uh, the lack of Native women in film and television is a direct link to our murdered and Indigenous women. And how is that a direct link? Because if we're not seen and heard, we're not recognized. As we gave an example earlier in the conversation about how we've been written off of, of episodic television, we're not seen, we're not heard, we don't matter. So it, it's it, the call to action was supported by uh, our now uh, Madam Secretary Deb Holland, and um, so many other incredible women have come on board. Uh, Michelle and I could just go on and on and on um, with why we wear red. So um, I just wanted to bring that up. And your film, Michelle, for the audience to know, has also screened at our bigger festival, which is Red Nation International Film Festival, and. Um, you know, I, I just, uh, we're gonna wrap this up. I just love all of you so much. And uh, you know, you, you always have a place and a, a seat at this table at Native Women in Film and Television. 
at our Red Nation International Film Festival, uh, you know, and keep making movies. And, you know, you know that we will support you over here. Our board will be supportive of you and your efforts. And um, let's just keep doing this and having these conversations and getting together and seeing each other at the festivals. So I wanna thank you, Georgina and Alma and Michelle. I love you all very much. So we're gonna wrap this up today. I'm gonna to give you the listening audience some information. Native Women in Film and Television and All Media was founded in 1995 and started as a Native Women in Music Festival in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We went on to having its own program of screenings at the annual international, Red Nation International Film Festival. Films directed by women would screen in, in the month of November and still do. But the board decided that in 2003, it needed to be its own standalone voice leading up to the Academy Awards each year of our Native and Women in Film and Television Film Festival. So right now, today, we're in our 13th annual. We're the only Native Women in Film and Television Film Festival in the country, maybe the world, I don't know. And I hope this inspires all of you out there to tune in, binge watch this week, 40 films directed by women at nativewomeninfilm.com. We are also, um, we also uh, uh, are there as activists for native and indigenous women's rights in all media platforms with a focus on equal opportunities for native indigenous women in front of and behind the camera with our RNCI crew, encouraging the creative narrative, exploring and empowering authentic and honest portrayals of native and indigenous women. Expanding empowerment in initiatives and in campaigns in the arts, media, social justice, civil, civic engagement, economic development, research, training, professional development programs, grants and international relation. We've been doing this for a hot minute. We're in our 27th year this August. Native Women in Film and Television is, is, uh, is serves under the fiscal partner of Red Nation Celebration Institute, the creative enterprise by Natives develop, delivering to all people the stories that shape our world. RNCI, the pioneer longest standing native women led indigenous media arts and cultural nonprofit in the city of LA, empowering native and indigenous storytellers. The purpose is to empower our native and indigenous independent women filmmakers to create diverse roles, to increase, and, and all filmmakers, native <laughs> filmmakers, to increase exposure for native films made by our filmmakers, showcasing feature and short length. Who tells the story matters. That's our mission. And natives in charge of our narrative, empowering you out there to create your own stories. And, and RNCI over here, having the platform to showcase and promote your work on all levels. I'd like to announce that this June, we will be launching a program that we've had for 27 years, Native Youth Matter. If I could see it, I can be it. But we have reframed it. We have reimagined it. And it's now called Native Indigenous Student Academy for Cinematic Arts. And it's a whole, a whole entity on itself. Because each year, we have student filmmakers enter their films into the Native Women Film Festival and also Red Nation Film Festival. But like Native Women, it now has to be its standalone entity because we have so many submissions. And we don't want to have that. 
what, what, what's happened with our Academy Awards, where we, we put these categories to the side and not broadcast them. So we have broken it up. <laughs> so everything will be inclusive and everyone could be acknowledged. And so I encourage you to, to experience us at rednationff.com, rednationcele.org, and nativewomeninfilm.com. All of this programming streams on our Red Nation television network, predating Netflix. We were streaming before Netflix. The only other streaming service was YouTube and they had some silly stuff on there. And now it's just this full blown streaming all over the world, which is, which is gorgeous because there's no excuse now. Everyone can see native and indigenous content and everyone can come on board and support the native indigenous voice. So I want to thank you all for attending this, this conversation today. Who tells a story matters, representation matters. And again, thank you ladies for, for being with us today. And um, tomorrow uh, we have another conversation happening. So check out the website and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.